Hey. Hey. Hello, hello. Hey, it's 2020, new decade. Here we are. <laughs> Happy New Year. You know, I love West Coast. Um, I think we project people. How many people from the West Coast here? All right, a lot. And how many producers? Very good. How many musicians? All right, you're in the right room. So uh, we project compassion, generosity, uh, optimism. And these are qualities that are present in the music as well. Um, so welcome to, produce, uh, to producing the new West Coast. Uh, it was, the music was developed in the 50s and 60s, and uh, it truly reflects the, commun the diverse communities, um, Afro-Cuban, Latin, uh, and uh, Brazilian. Uh, author of West Coast Jazz, the book, uh, Ted Goya, I was in touch with a couple of years ago, and uh, he, his book is about the early architects of West Coast Jazz, Jeff Baker, Bill Evans, Miles Davis, uh, but it really goes only through the 60s, so uh, a lot has happened since, and we have a wonderful panel here who have been working with a new, producing the new albums, and so we, we will have, have questions about what's going on now. Uh, the second wave, um, Herbie Hancock, Herb Alpert, uh, certainly uh, put their stamp. And then, you know, it seems that West Coast music really kind of evolved and went into mainstream, you know, with especially California being center of, you know, film and TV industries. And we have that perspective too from the panel. Um, then today, Kawasi Washington, Jacob Collier, Robert Glasper, uh, who knows, and Concord Records are putting out some really exciting stuff. And also there's a lot of great independent labels. Uh, some of our panelists have their own labels here. So um, according to Ted Goya, the third big wave is here. And it's thriving because of uh, the new infrastructure that's in place, mainly uh, great educational opportunities. And we have uh, Daniel with us who can talk about that as well. Um, super excited to bring you this panel. Thank you for being here. Say hello to my co-presenter, Brad Lundy. Brad is, um, I, his nickname is Q from James Bond because he's the man with the gadget. And, you know, he, his booth, 14914 on the showroom floor, if you get a chance, please go visit him. And you want to say a little bit about um, what you're doing there? Sure. Uh, we're demonstrating at Atmos Music on our booth. And we're trying to help people have a chance to hear what Atmos Music can sound like. It's, there's a lot of demos going on that don't sound good, so we'd like to present one that sounds the way it ought to. With and, all the noise and everything. Well, it's not easy. We have an ISO room down there that we built, and we're playing uh, Giles Martin's new Abbey Road mix, and uh, which not many people have heard. So come down there, and you'll have a chance to hear it. Only takes about five minutes. Awesome. Awesome. Let's go check it out before you. Um, so this is together is our eight year of presenting Tech Tracks with Nam. And uh, I'm Therese Dodge with Studio Espresso, and we have over 100 producers uh, with incredible credits, although I think Al Schmidt really beats everyone on the credit side. <laughs> so you can sign up at Studio Espresso uh, for our monthly e-signs, um, and we will try to leave 10 minutes at the end for Q&As. Um, uh, but I wanted to start with... Um, so that's so, uh, Mr. Herbie Hancock uh, quotes uh, Dr. Clarence Fisher as one of his influences, uh, among others like Ravel, El Bill Evans, and so uh, we have uh, Brent Fisher, his son, today. And so I want to talk a little bit about language uh, of you know uh, West Coast jazz and the harmonic vocabulary that. Brent, you know, the Fisher brand is so well known for. So tell us a little bit about the language and uh, is it the session players? Is it the composition and arrangement? Where do you get this? I mean, it's very interesting how 
And speaking of Ravel, music like that sort of got the, the first jazzers in the 19, you know, 1915, 1920, right? That's 100 years ago. Um, got them their impetus, and then and then it just kind of took off from there in many, many different directions. But there, are, there's this relationship between jazz, gospel, and R and B, and I think that's also why my father and I have crossed over into working with so many R and B artists over the years, and some gospel as well. Um, there's a relationship there, but then beyond that, there's also, again, the, just the, uh, the the great symphonic influence building on history from, from Bach on up to all the great 20 and 20th and 21st century composers. I listen to as much of that as I as I do to um, all the current jazz that's going on, and, and then there's you know there's there's a lot of cross speed now between hip hop and jazz, but that's also within sort of the R and B realm. Um, now, the, the the harmonies are something that you can you can um, experiment around with. Let's say more complicated textures in jazz, and especially if you're dealing with a large ensemble like a big band, or you're dealing with a, a jazz group plus strings or woodwinds. You get a lot more opportunity to deal with richer textures here than you will in some other styles of music. And even even classical music, they won't go for that in strictly classical music. If they want to hear Mozart, it's, you know, this is very triadic harmony. But the thing that that has kept jazz as part of this, you know, timeless music that is at once current today for this century and and um, Historically relevant for all the, the you know the decades that, that came before it is this is this interest in what happened before. You know there are a lot of people in a lot of different genres that they think to themselves, well, we should just escape that. Let's do something new and exciting. And it turns out to be you know that was like new wave music in the 80s, right? Or or grunge in the 90s. And and, and that music is still there a little bit, right? There must be a new wave. Uh, convention somewhere, but but what keeps jazz going is that you know we, we're we're listening to all these sounds, we're synthesizing it into a personal statement. You know all the artists out there and producers within our creative division, and uh, and so we're paying attention to what else is going on in the world, and then synthesizing it towards our own ends. So yeah, this versatility in various genres, uh, and even though it's an American art form. Um, you know, Ted Doya in his book describes the architecture of West Coast jazz as more composition arrangement based, less individual improvised playing, relaxed tempos, and um, experimentation with instruments and new sounds, which is what you were talking about. A huge um, influence on both coasts, right? From Brazil and, yeah. uh, and, and from uh, African music. Yeah. Exactly. Um, you have to forgive me, I'm not giving them the proper introduction. Uh, you know, Brent is a multi-grammy winner. He's done uh, five or six uh, of his Claire Fisher uh, jazz albums. In addition to working on a lot of R&D, uh, hip-hop records, Michael Jackson, Prince, and D'Angelo more recently, about who won a Grammy for uh, Best R&D Song and Album in 2016. Uh, I want to go to another Gen 2. Uh, your father, Mel Torme. This is uh, James Torme, everyone. International concert and recording artist. He just got back from New York with 10 sold out shows at Birdland. Um, and you played with symphony orchestras as well as intimate rooms. Uh, tell us a little bit about lessons you have learned from that and how you're bringing um, this music to new generations. Sure. Um... Well, for better or for worse, I've dedicated the last several years and several layers of touring here and in Europe to uh, the West Coast, what I call the reinvention of the West Coast. And uh, it's really a nice bed to lie in for a vocalist because the arranging is so strong that you can pretty much leave it as it is. but sing it a little differently. So I'll, you know, um, I'll put runs, R&B runs and things into little bits and pieces that are much more contemporary influences. Stylizing it. Yeah, and on a small group level and also all the way up to, you know, big band. 
Um, and I mean, I was doing a show yesterday in Phoenix called The Best of the West Coast, just to give you an yeah. example. So, um, but yeah, I've done a lot of chapters of, of this kind of music, and I just, as that author, whoever that author is, um, is saying, uh, it's, it was a very effortless, some people call it subdued form of jazz, uh, but I don't think that really does it justice. Um, I think that uh, just the, some of the complexity, a little bit of the almost classical influence uh, in some of the way that people like Marty Page, Shorty Rogers, Russ Garcia, uh, Pete Rugolo, Bill Byers, um, and a bunch of other cats like that um, put into it. Uh, those are the people that I try to highlight, Chet Baker, and of course Miles, who his nonette uh, in The Birth of the Cool, which is pretty much my favorite jazz record of all time, um, sort of inspired a lot of the other things that have now been predicated on it. But uh, I have a lot of fun with um, sort of reimagining the West Coast sound and also reaching a lot of people that really don't know much about it. I try to give a little bit of a history lesson when I do a show well, thank you for without doing overdoing that. that, you know. Educating, programming, there's a lot involved, so yeah. in a way you wear your producer hat to do all of that. Yeah. And uh, speaking of, and the collaborations too, because you know, like you, holiday, you had a holiday show called uh, Mel and Ella. Oh yeah, yeah. But had also, my out. album uh, was co-produced by John DeBursa and David Page, who's okay. the great uh, Marty Page's sure. son. So. Yeah. Keep it in the family a little bit there. Um, yeah. But, you know, I was recording uh, one of the days up in Calabasas at David's studio up there, and I, uh, I asked him about his dad. You know, I said, you know, I was in the studio with both of our fathers as a kid, but I, I, um, I what was it like growing up under his roof? And he said, have you ever seen the film Pat? <laughs> okay. and it was like a mixture between the actual general and George C. Scott who played Pat. Um, but my dad was a little more forgiving of the cat. Um, but what they shared was uh, just a certain, uh, discipline, a, a certain right? discipline yeah. and uh, an ability to just paint. You know, they called Marty the Picasso of jazz. Um, but it's interesting, the West Coast movement, it's a little bit misunderstood, you know, people have a hard time putting their finger on what it is, yeah. actually. And I, I also, uh, I wanted to go to Al because he's worked with Miles Davis, and who he hasn't worked with is really what I want to know. But, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you know, just uh, part of that, I think there's just exceptional musicians really kind of taking the West Coast sound to really mainstream, into pop, R&B, whatever it's selling, film, television, um, you know, so it's really like uh, people like Mark Isham and, you know, they're, they were really jazz. I love, the Mark, I love people like Marty Page and right. Johnny Mandel, who also started, who, who started back east and then adopted the West Coast and ended up having a career in films. Exactly. Um, they, they really are responsible for, for pushing that sound. And then, you know, and Marty was working with Michael Jackson in the end, in other words, so they, they were able to cross over. Yeah. Uh, somehow based on those foundations. Exactly, same with Claire Fisher. And, uh, Al, what was it like working with Miles? Miles? Yeah. Uh, Did you record and make? Yeah, yeah, I just worked on the Keith album. I didn't spend a lot of time with it. So um, he was not the most social of, of, of guys. He was busy uh, doing what he was doing. Yeah. Uh, it was cool. But getting back to the jazz thing, when I was in New York working as an engineer, I was doing Chet Baker and Jerry Mulligan. I did the, 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 the songbook album with Jerry Mulligan and the Five Brothers and um, Bobby Brookmeyer and Jim Hall. And, and this was all done in New York with Freddie Green on guitar and, and some of the great players in New York. But it was all released on Pacific Jazz. Uh -huh. Big Bob was the owner of Pacific Jazz at that time, and he would come to New York to, to use me on the jazz tapes. And we got along famously, and one day he said to me, yeah, you gotta come to LA. Uh, I don't wanna have to keep flying here to use you. And I said, well, give me a job out there, and I'll, I'll come. That's why you came here. here. And, and we were joking, I thought. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I, know. I called three weeks later, I got a new job out here, I 
was a dad was at the studio in LA. So I wound up packed up my family and came to California. Yeah, you know, and then of course the first thing I did roped into the leash was uh Henry Mancini and Tina Donovan. At breakfast at Tiffany's. Wow. Uh, came over the lane, I mean, wow. Incredible. Another great uh, composer who really took uh, that art into mainstream and film and television. And I worked with a lot of like Shorty. I worked with Shorty all the time. And he had a pseudonym when he was doing movies called Boots Brown. That was his name for the, for the R&D stuff he was doing. But uh, to be honest with you, when I came, and you know, Charlie Parker and Laurie, New York, everybody out there, and I came out here. I didn't know the difference between West Coast and San Diego. You did not. Uh -huh. It's all the good jazz music over here. Some of the great players. I mean, they, they call Miles a West Coast jazz father. Oh, there he is. Right. But wouldn't right. you say it's more bebop in New York versus here is just more, you know? I had a friend once refer to New York jazz as sort of a take no prisoners type of jazz, very aggressive. And um, I don't know if that's accurate or not, but I, I think maybe yeah, there's a, there, there's maybe more of an edge to it. Um, that's but see that that's a, I, 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 like I have I have East Coast players in my big band now they live here on the West Coast so I mean. Uh, it's so all, you agree it's all with blended, Al? It's all it's blended all, together. Yeah, yeah, it's all kind of blended together. So yeah. Al, for 23 Grammys, I think they ran out of Grammys. <laughs> <laughs> After they, you know, met Al. But he also has this great book called On the Record. You should look it up on Amazon. Um, and I love the first story there, because uh, your exposure to recording a jazz album for your first time. Talk about that. Yeah. My book. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. I was a kid working with my parents out in Brooklyn Quick. Just my job. It's my mic. My mic. Speaking to the mic. My mentor, I, when I got the job, is that working? Yeah. Uh, it was Tommy Dow. And so I worked with him for like three months. And on finally, they said, okay, on Saturday, you can come in and do these little demo things. And people would come in and sing happy birthday to their kid, or they wrote a song, and they would come in and we'd do a little batch of tape, 78, give it to them, they give me 15 bucks and leave. Um, somebody else came That's in. That's what the studios song. are doing today. What's that? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> so somebody else came in and played two of them, sang a song, and did the same thing. So I had a 10 o'clock, a 12 o'clock, and a 2 o'clock. The 2 o'clock said Mr. Mercer. So I'm waiting, wait, waiting for Mr. Mercer to show up. And uh, the elevator doors open up, and all these musicians start coming out. And I'm saying Billy Strayhorn. And, uh, <laughs> I mean, all these, my idols. It was like Joe DiMaggio and Babe Ruth coming out of the elevator. And, and they said, where's the studio? And I said, well, the studio's right there. Why? Well, we're here for the recording session. I said, no, that's a mistake. I said, it's just a little demo. No, no, Mercer Records, Mercer Ellington stuff. And that's when I got a little nervous. <laughs> so I tried to call my boss. I couldn't reach him. But you tried to call Tommy. I couldn't reach him. I had a notebook that Tommy had given me where I drew diagrams of setups. I had to set up, set the band up. We only had eight faders. So I could only set up eight mics. And Duke walked in and uh, I explained to him that I was not qualified to do this. He <laughs> said, so, uh, Don't worry, son, we're going to do food. Looks like the guys out there are having fun. And we did. So uh, that was my first. And that was your first time. Right. Uh, well, one of my, I think, did you record at Capitol uh, Paul McCartney doing my Valentine? Yes. That session. Yes. That is one of the most beautiful, yes. and I think the video won a Grammy. I posted it on Studio Expresso on the home page, so please uh, view that. It is the most amazing, um, you know, first of all, the musicians. There's Diane Krall on piano. There's, uh, uh, I forget, Eric Clapton is there. Yeah. And, uh, and Paul McCartney singing my Valentine, he actually gets very emotional. Yeah. 
and uh, you capture that somehow because. Well, he wrote that for his wife, so a lot of exactly. the emotion exactly. was coming from him. Most beautiful uh, piece. Um, I want to just go a little bit to uh, Laura Dickinson, um, who's worked with Michael Buble, and your kids probably know her voice better than anyone anyone else because she uh, she does a lot of shows for Disney Channel. Does anyone have kids? <laughs> I don't. I just have a puppy. <laughs> <laughs> but four Grammys, three Emmys, and uh, I think you're quite a versatile musician in that um, not only you're um, crossing industry, film and TV, you've got your own big band, and you're crossing over roles, you're a contractor, you're a singer, performer. So how do you Thank juggle you. all of that? What a nice compliment. That's awesome. This is Clarice Dodge, everyone, <laughs> for bringing us all together. Thank you for the compliment. It's been really fun to use all of... I mean, my first session was when I was seven years old, and the person that mentored me and taught me how to contract always used to say that your dad had the best pitch of anybody he had ever worked with. And it's just been such a great experience to try and speak about my journey in that I didn't get any music education because I was so strictly religiously raised and without a music ministry and so I kind of had to drop out of high school when I was 15 to go and start performing and yet my dad played with uh, Bruce Palmer and Dewey Martin from Buffalo Springfield. If you don't remember Buffalo Springfield you might remember. I think it's time we stop children what's that sound? That's Buffalo Springfield. Neil Young, Stephen Stills, great, great artists. And I had them in my garage growing up. So even though I didn't get to go to a formal university and train, I got to, you know, study Claire and Brent scores. And I got to have people like that in my garage. So that was, it was fun to kind of see where all of those experiences took me, you know, being 16 years old and hanging out with Rodney Douglas back there working on the Jungle Cruise at Disneyland and uh, all the way up to having my voice on TV every day and learning how to arrange with just my voice first. I always grew up playing piano. I had parents that told me, you can't play the guitar until your hands are big enough, you know. I was like, please, please, please. My mother and father both played the guitar, so it was nice to learn to use my voice as an instrument. And that's part of how we branded. My main breakout job was Phineas and Ferb. Started that in 2006 and did that for seven years. And we created this type of sound where I would write with the composer, you know, six to eight female vocal parts, female identified and you know, six to eight male, and we would stack it all up and write it like I would hear horns in a big band, you know, growing up listening to the best of the capital years, Frank Sinatra, so it's been quite a life. That's awesome. <laughs> um, thank you, Laura. So I wanted to switch to Mookie here, who um, is, can bring us maybe the, well, you've worked with uh, Sarah Vaughn and Yvonne Linz in the jazz, world, and more recently, talk about the current album that's out um, with Sergio Mendes. It's the Latin side of you. Yes. Uh, well, first of all, thank you for having me here. Of um, course. I don't even know why you invited me, because you know, all these amazing people here. You just get to enjoy all the story and the privilege see. Uh, anyways, well, was, you know, this album actually is coming out today, and... In the key uh, of joy on Concord Records. Yeah, exactly. And also uh, celebrating the documentary that is being released at the moment. Right. And working with Sergio. In, in fact, one, one thing that for me was always very rewarding because I, uh, my grandfather would play in the house, go train Parker and Miles and all that. And I, I wasn't actually really attracted to that at a young age. You know, I was more into a different genre of music. But I was always affected to Jobin and Joan Jobeat and all that, which is for me, they, they, were, they were like pop music. You know, I grew up listening to Gerber Panima, you know, that was my soundtrack going to the beach. Not bad. Not bad. <laughs> and that is when I moved here and I actually started in the music business. That, that is considered jazz. I don't think that is one uh, uh, a jazz artist 
since 1960 that have not attempted and successfully done a bossa nova or Brazilian uh, approach to one of their compositions. So, because for me, somehow I always felt that you need, a, you need it to be special to enjoy jazz because of the, the improvisation and the, 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 the melodic sequence and the harmonies and all that. But because of the, the fact that I was so close to Brazilian music, which worldwide was jazz, it, it came to me painfully, it, it was painless. You know, it was just like a very cool way to experience. And in 1992, we did a, a very cool jazz album with Sergio called Brasileiro, and the opening track has 125 percussion players playing. Oh, wow. So, which is not usually for a jazz ensemble. Uh, <laughs> usually you have a little less. Yes. So, it, this is like, and, and by the way, this is why you, in my heart, it's so more towards the West Coast jazz because it's, it, it's really lighter in the sense that remember me <coughs> at a young age trying to understand what was happening with Kurt, Parker, Coltrane, all that, and I said, no, no, this is too, just too hard for me. Uh -huh. So when I got here, it, it got easy. Like for instance, I worked with Santa Camargo Mariano, Mariano, and one of the first amazing jazz key, uh, keyboard players. And one of the, the first records that I produced uh, for Cesar, he wrote a song for Claire Fisher. Mm -hmm. And Claire came to the studio to work. So I, I had the privilege to, to work with this amazing jazz artist, being part of a composition, not writing, but being part of the whole process, writing to one of our biggest idols. And I had the idol present to absorb that at That's that awesome. moment. Yeah. And I still remember this day when a certain moment Claire said, can, can you please stop the tape? Um, oh, no. <laughs> no, he was so emotional. Claire said, listen, and I got every cover for two minutes and play it over again. So. Very sweet. Well, we're very fortunate to have with us Daniel C. Uh, he is director of the uh, Herbie Hancock Institute at uh, Herb Alpert School at UCLA. He, he's a director and he also is DJ at Hey Jazz. Um, I just listened, streamed his uh, radio show, Excursions it's called, on uh, 88.1 on Thursday night, 10 p.m., so listen to that. He's worked as a musician um, on 50-plus albums, um, Kendrick, Kendrick Lamar and um, DJ Khalil um, and Jay-Z, to name a few. So tell us a little bit about what's happening there, and who are your alums, and okay. how are you uh, bringing the new generation of West Coasters? So uh, the Herbie Hancock Institute of Jazz, which up until um, about a year ago was called the Thelonious Monk Institute of Jazz, uh, is a nonprofit organization. And uh, the program that I am responsible for is called the Herbie Hancock Institute of Jazz Performance at UCLA. And what we do is every two years, we accept one band into the program. So one drummer, bass player, piano player, sax player, and then beyond that, the instrumentation changes. We've had vocalists, trumpet players, trombone, vibes. We currently have this virtuoso harmonica player. And the people who come uh, fill out a really difficult application, and then they audition for Herbie Hancock, Wayne Shorter, Herb Alpert, and a series of other people, which is, uh, some people say, cruel to do, but <laughs> if they get into the program, the program's full scholarship, their housing's covered, and they get $1,000 a month, and they're studying with Herbie Hancock and every great jazz artist. So, to my way of thinking, there should be a pretty intense challenge to uh, get that handed to you. Um, so I've been uh, responsible for that program since 2000. So I, I, I don't, I should know the number, maybe about 10 classes. So what happens is we have people come in, and they come from all over the world. So we have people from Israel, Japan, Italy, and France, and about 50% of them stay here in Los Angeles. So uh, Gretchen Parlato, the vocalist, is a graduate of the program. Leonel Loweke, the guitar player who tours with Herbie Hancock. Ambrose Akinusuri, who's originally from San Francisco and now lives in San Francisco. Um, like Al and James were saying earlier, I, don't, I can't say for sure that anything I'm involved with is particularly West Coast jazz per se, because the musicians come from all over and their influences are from all over, and I don't think any of them that come to the program are dedicated to preserving or following a lineage of 
anything that necessarily came from the West Coast. Um, they're all modern players. They're all, they'd all be heavily influenced by Miles and Coltrane and, and stuff that I guess would be more associated with the East Coast. But they stay here, and then whatever they're doing here, by virtue of where it's located, would be considered West Coast jazz. I don't know if anyone here is familiar with Ambrose Acumusery's music, but it's pretty modern, intense music. He's from San Francisco. He went to the Institute, graduated, moved to New York, and came back. But he'd be an example of music that's West Coast jazz. He's from the West Coast. And he lives in the West Coast. But it doesn't, it, listening to it, you wouldn't notice anything in common with Jerry Mulligan or Chet Baker, per se. Um, but I'm saying that to say there's a wave of stuff that's happening it's that here. It's new experimentation, you know, just kind of creating something new. It is. Yeah, so it is. I think on. that's probably happening everywhere. But from my point of view, what I'm seeing is that the Institute sort of plants these seeds by bringing these top level players from all over the world, young players, and then they end up settling here. So they stay here for a number of reasons. Uh, you had mentioned to me that uh, you know, film work and TV work is you know, potentially more lucrative than trying to be a straight ahead jazz musician the rest of your life. New York is becoming harder to handle financially for people. So the old track for the Institute students was you come here and you go right to New York. And the then, economy of things kind of that stopped changed. about 10 years ago. And it used to be 100% of the class went, then it was 20%, 50%. Now almost 100% are staying here. But that's great because, as an example, the, the, the people that are here that would hire musicians from Los Angeles count on the Institute to vet these players. So Billy Child is an example. Billy will just hire our bass player and drummer sight on scene. As soon as, the, as soon as we accept the bass, he'll call and say, Daniel, who's your new bass player? And they say, oh, give me his number. And then he but they put them on the gig right away. So uh, we, we're a sort of a feeder system for uh, a whole slew of great young musicians. And if you look at, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead, go ahead. I was gonna say the Blue Whale is where, for me, the best young jazz players are. I was saying to someone else earlier that you can pretty much go to the Blue Whale any night of the week and see really good quality, modern, current, progressive jazz. If you look at their calendar, it's like 75% Institute graduates. Um, that's that's just, impressive. Yeah. You mentioned Chris, uh, some of your alums, Chris Bowers, yes. who did my favorite film, Green Book. Right. Uh, Jonathan Pinson, Correct. who did Kamasi Washington, Kamasi, yeah. and Christian Newman, yep. with Jacob Collier. Right. Jacob, you recognized uh, many years ago and really enjoyed his work. Yeah. And he's from London, so right. you're right. Right. Yeah. yeah, they end up geographically located here. Maybe you can see some artistic lineage, maybe not, but it's, if they're here and they're making music here, that's what's happening yeah. here. And because of the Institute students and the rise of more clubs and the interest in the audience, there's sort of a thing bubbling up right now. Yeah. Daniel, I want to ask you about sampling, because uh, you yeah. do a good job on your uh, radio show, right. um, kind of bringing uh, the new generation, you know, maybe teaching the new generation about uh, the early masters uh, using samples right. of their work. So I was asked by KJazz to do a hip hop and jazz program because for the last 20 years I've run the West Coast office of the Institute and simultaneously worked as a bass player, guitar player, and a writer on hip hop records. So I've had this kind of parallel track of hip hop and jazz happening. And so the station approached me about doing a hip hop and jazz show. Um, they didn't have a specific concept in mind, so I came back to them with the idea that what I would do was play hip hop tracks that sample from jazz back to back with the original so that you could hear, as an example, the show is named after a tribe called Quest Song called Excursions, and that's a song that samples in our Blakey record. So if you've been listening to Excursions for the last 20 years, 30 years, you've been listening to this Blakey record, but you've never heard the record all the way through. So I played them back to back so you can see, and you know, that first week I had a lot of friends texting me like, I never knew where that's, that's where that came from. Well, that bass part was Ron Carter, I didn't know. So it's a way of kind of luring people in in the hopes that after they hear where it comes from, um, that they'll investigate the jazz side. Is it working? I have no idea. It seems to be mostly hip hop fans listening to the record. I don't know if they're digging, digging any deeper right. and getting into jazz. I'm interested in that. I'm always, like, that's, as a musician, I'm always interested in trying to find the root of, like, you know, Brent Herbie told me that uh, his interest in harmony came from listening to high lows. And your dad was arranging the high lows. So that's like that's the type of stuff that fascinates me is where do Herbie's chords come from? They come from the high lows. Where do the high lows chords come from? They come from Claire Fisher. So I'm always interested in that type of stuff. So that's that's what kind of keeps me engaged with Well, the I show. think great musicians, that's what they do, is they dig into the past yeah. and the history and yeah. really understand and right. take a little bit from, you know, and then they kind of they just create their own color, right. their own voice. Yeah. 
So the show is to sort of draw people in, um, give a little background about where uh, the music comes from, and it's through the sampling process, which is a whole other tricky topic we could talk about for hours. Yeah, the, you know, the publishing arena, because I know sometimes, you know, you get that, you know, they work with Michael Jackson, they right. work with Prince, and, you know, it's like, hey, send me some samples. Right. Like, well, I don't own them, really. I can't. <laughs> so it's, it's a balance, it's a challenge, but I like the educational aspect of it. I know Brent does uh, master classes, and um, coming up in the summer, he's planning to do um, an educational, uh, intense, kind of called the Fisher Experience. You want to talk a little bit about that? And Where, when did that title come out? <laughs> this is all brand new. I don't know. I've had my head buried in a score, which used to mean I had a paper in front of me, but now it means a computer screen. Um, so. That's right, you have a deadline, so you don't know about yeah, this yet. So I, okay. Yeah, you know more about this than I do. But, well, basically, when, when I teach privately, whether it's in person or via Skype, the whole idea is to, is to help a player realize how to differentiate themselves, okay? You have all these fan, you know, fantastic new talent, but people are always interested, interested at first at, at, at sounding like their idols. They want to emulate their idols, but I, I want to... I want to teach people how to take the music of their idol, synthesize it into their own personal statement. And that's what I feel that I have done with the music that not only my father gave me, but all of the experiences that he had before that. Um, I, I think you're doing a phenomenal job also. It's the same thing. You take all the influences of your father. So I can relate. Yeah, yeah. and, and then uh -huh. every, every influence that they had, and then you synthesize it into a personal statement. And so that's. That's, I think, what helps you differentiate yourself in the music industry instead of just kind of being one of many that you say, oh, this is, you know, representative of this genre. I, I'd rather, well, I, I like to be representative of certain genres or, or let's say of many genres, but I also like to be able to hopefully be remembered for having my own musical voice. And that's I, what this is about. Thank you. I, I want to close. Um, with this, but uh, open it to your questions, uh, last 10 minutes. And that is that the role of fans is super important. Um, and because among fans, and Brent's experienced this, that there are sponsors and, you know, um, that come and really uh, help your career. Uh, this I just found online. In 1930s, Aaron Copeland sent Blanche Bolton a handwritten list of suggested guests for an after concert party. And these were uh, prominent people in her apartment. So um, these were prominent people and, uh, you know, the philanthropists and so on. And I think that's what it takes to uh, nurture new music, which is so important, um, supporting composers and new music. And another um, fantastic lady um, who's a patron of new music, her name is Betty Freeman. She said, all music is fine, but I like complexity, challenge, ambiguity, and abstraction. And we need more of that, uh, support, you know, people who support music. So, questions, anyone? Or should we just continue the last one? We do have a question and answer mic right up in the center. I know some people are recording. Yeah, I'm sorry, I can't see you. So just, if you have a question, head to that mic right there in the center. <laughs> I know already what it's going to be. It's such a short time, and you want to spend like five hours with each, each of them, <laughs> right? Thank you, first of all, all of you guys. Actually, my question was directed to Daniel. Um, um, you ever thought about, you said you didn't know if the effect of, you know, asking, showing people that, hey, this is where the music is coming from in hip hop. Here's the origins of that, right? So I was sitting here, you know, I'm in psychology, right? We measure, we study, we, we ask people to do surveys. Maybe at the end of your show, send them to SurveyMonkey or something like that so that you can measure. Yeah. Because I think it's really important to measure, you know, the effects of what we're doing. You know, and as a musician and as a MA psychology former student, I understand the importance of that. That's how we get funding. Right. You know, that's how we grow. Yeah. So, just a suggestion. Yeah, great idea. 
I always find it interesting sometimes when, when I when I get comments from non musicians about what they like about a certain band, you know, sometimes the comment can just be, I like the way they dress. You know, it, it, because it's it's like it's like the total package, and I think that's another thing that younger jazz musicians out here are much more aware of is branding and appearance and, and you know the the overall package of how you present your music, not just the audio element itself. Well, I think you do a great job with that. You like my sweater? I do. <laughs> yeah, you know, I bought it secondhand. Well, Six hundred dollars. There's something to be said about your image and, um, you know, and, and not just uh, what you're wearing, but the, the show itself, yeah. like with programming. I mean, right now, people are so used to audiovisuals, and they want to see more. I'm not like that. I personally, I love just the music. Don't distract me. Right. But I think, you know. Some of the great cats, I mean, you know, Buddy Rich and people like that, who I grew up lucky enough to spend time with, they were real close horses. And, yeah. and my dad was one of those too. And then at some point, he just kind of got off that train. He didn't really worry about it, just throw on a little polo shirt, whatever. You know, um, but uh, style, you know, culture, music culture is intertwined with the visual side of, yeah. of what we do. And, and I, I have to admit, although when I go out on tour, you know, uh, the personalities are really the, the bedside manner, if you will, of the people are, are really my first consideration. I learned that over time. At first, I just went for the sickest players, you know what I mean? And then I realized that, you know, people that were easy to be with and travel with. Uh, but then another element that I, I must confess, you know, is in there somewhere in the, uh, uh, you know, in the recipe uh, is on stage the look, the look of the outfit, you know what I mean? I mean Yesterday, I was with uh, uh, Lyndon Rochelle, who's a wonderful drummer, J.P. Maramba from the Philippines, Lyndon Rochelle, and uh, Robert Turner, both East L.A. cats, and, you know, um, been lucky enough to, I kind of came up with a little music family that included people like Tomasi and Steven Bruner and, and all the cats, Ryan Cross and, and everybody. Um, but, uh, you know, just to be... Uh, saying something on that on that on that other level is is it's appealing and it also allows us to uh, uh, to attract people who might not otherwise exactly. even give a chance you know to what we're trying to do. Um, but you know, just coming back to the new generation thing, I'm putting together a television special right now that I can't talk too much about, but it's going to be uh, sort of reimagining my father's repertoire and introducing a whole new generation. Of a lot of the people we've been talking about, actually, and oh, my father and me. It's, it's called the, it's called songs of my father. Songs of yeah, my father. yeah, sort of a little yeah. bit of an ode to the Horace Silver uh, song for my father. But um, you mentioned Jacob Collier, who's yeah. a friend of mine. Um, I, I'm signed actually as a pop artist to Universal and right. with Bungalow Records, Paul Ring label over there, and um, I just recorded an EP uh, that's called Strange Little Planet, and it's very much, I guess, what you would call that next level of what we're trying to do, which is, um, it's along the lines of, I don't know, if you took Michael Jackson and, and Take Six and put it a little bit with uh, Jacob Collier, um, a lot of harmonies, but that's totally predicated on what we've been talking about today, which is, uh, well, the high lows, you know, uh, starting really off karaoke, uh, the high lows, uh, which were predicated on my dad's wartime, in some ways, on my dad's wartime vocal group, the Meltones. Uh, you know, I, a lot of the little cat, cats come up and say, um, people from the vocal groups that are now doing their own innovations, which are continuing those voicings from West Coast jazz in many ways. And that sort of, I call it sophistipop. Um, but um, they come up and go, oh, we would never exist if it wasn't for the Meltones. I'm like, you know the Meltones? Uh -huh. uh, but yeah, I have a, an EP in the can, and I'm just looking for the right person to mix uh, for Universal. Yeah, yeah there's some good here. choices here. <laughs> 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 thanks for inviting me, you know. Oh my goodness, um, thanks for being here. But, uh, and anyway, it's, so that's predicated on, you know, you go back to Take Six, 
Spinoza made a huge, huge uh, wave when they originally came out. My dad was helpful in, in actually launching them. They'd open for him at the bowl and stuff like that. Um, and and then before that, the high lows, you know. But then you have Manhattan Transfer. You know, there were there've been generations of keeping that sophistication, but finding new ways to voice it and cross over a little into pop. It's interesting that one of the first things is, and we have some session singers in the audience, thank you, but that's one of the first questions I ask if someone's coming to me as a contractor. Have you been in a real nitty gritty hardcore acapella group? Like, do you know how to use your voice as an instrument? Can you read? Can you actually morph your voice into sounding like instruments? And those are the ideal session singers that we find, so. Thank you so much. I'm honored. Yeah. Very important. Coming up in fashion week, cool. You do jack off for me. Uh -huh. <laughs> 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 On that note, enjoy yourself. Have a good time. 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 Have a good time.